Joshua 23, 1 to 16. I have a confession to make. On Wednesday, I felt old. Funny, just in the little prayer time before we came out, uh, me and Rosie were talking about old age as we're praying with all these youngsters in there. Um, but I felt old on Wednesday. No, it was Thursday, actually, and I'll tell you why. Me and Penny went to the Hawk Conservatory over at Andover. Really good visit, but I booked in as a senior citizen. <laughs> Yeah. Anyone over 60, I'm 62 now, anyone over 60 is classed as a senior citizen. And I tell you what, I, the re- I resisted ticking that box to start with, but then the silver lining was you got a discount, so blow that. I swallowed my pride and saved a few quid. But I did feel old when I ticked the box, I have to say. And uh, it reminded me of these little quotations, signs you're getting old. You might know some of them. Signs you're getting old. The grey-haired person you help across the street is actually your spouse. <laughs> no offence, love. <laughs> or signs you're getting old. You choose the cereal for the fibre and not the toy. <laughs> signs you're getting old. You know all the answers, but nobody asks you the questions. Signs you're getting old. You smile all the time because you can't hear a thing the people are saying. Signs you're getting old. Get lo- um, uh, an all-nighter means not having to get up to, g- to have a pee. <laughs> signs you're getting old. You're wrinkled, saggy, lumpy, and that's just your left leg. Signs you're getting old. You have trouble remembering words like... Um, or signs you're getting old. You sink your teeth into a juicy steak and they stay there. <laughs> And the last one, signs you're getting old, you've seen it all, you've done it all, you've heard it all, you just can't remember it all. (laughs) Now, why am I talking about old age? Because twice in the first two verses, Joshua emphasizes his getting old. Verse 1, Joshua was a very old man. Verse 2, Joshua said to them, I am very old. And then in verse 14, now I'm about to die and go the way of all the earth. Well, how old was he? Well, the next chapter tells us. Chapter 24, verse 29, he was 110. So you've got a bit of a way to go yet, Derek. 110, Joshua. (laughs) And the last two chapters in the book of Joshua are really his kind of final speech to the nation. His final speech. Key points he wants them to remember. And they divide up under a number of key words. And so this is the first one, faithfulness, verse 1 to 3. Faithfulness. Look at verse 1. After a long time had passed, the Lord had given Israel rest from their enemies around them. Joshua by now, a very old man. He summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and told them, I am very old. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. So Joshua says, you have witnessed, you have seen, you have evidence of the faithfulness of God. He made a promise and he kept it. I'm about to die, but I want you to know his faithfulness too. I want you to become a people of faith, just like I've been a man of faith. And Joshua and Caleb saw all the miracles God did when they led for, uh, left Egypt up until entering the promised land. I've got them listed here. There are 12 different miracles that Joshua at least witnessed. And the point of this first one is this. God keeps his promise. He traffics in truth. He never says one thing and fails to deliver. Now, be careful when you pull out the promises of God from the Bible. Christians do that all the time. Here's a bookmark with a promise on it. Here's a poster. Here's a Bible verse. Name it and claim it. You can't do that with the promises of God because some of them were for individuals, some of them for the nation of Israel, but there are some that are universal. And some of the promises are conditional. If you do this, I'll do that. So you can't claim the that unless you do the this. So you have to examine the promise in context before you kind of name it and claim it. But Joshua is saying, look, when God made a promise to us as his people, he never failed to deliver. God keeps his promises. 
He traffics in truth. He is 100% dependable. And Joshua wants uh, the nation to have the same faith that he and Caleb had themselves. Now, there's two things with faith. First of all, faith cannot be inherited. Faith cannot be inherited. So that means if your parents are Christians and you're a child of Christian parents, you're not a Christian automatically, just because they were. That's like saying, my dad was a doctor, therefore I'm a doctor. No, you must sit the exams yourself and qualify yourself. You don't inherit faith. They may prepare the way for you to come to faith, but you must make your own choice to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. God has no grandchildren, only children. So faith is the choice of every individual. Although you can't inherit faith, you can catch it, a bit like the measles. You can catch it. There is what's been called experiential faith. When you see faith in other people, it can be like a magnet, and you can think, I'd like some of that. I remember when I was a 19-year-old, shortly after I'd come to faith, I encountered two evangelists in Coventry City Centre, Bob Telford and Ivor Cooper doing an opening air. And I went along just to stand and watch them. And they were on fire. They were literally on fire for Jesus. And then they said to me, can you help us out? We're looking for security at our marquee. We're doing a tent mission in Coventry, and some mug, some person has to volunteer between... T- Two, uh, 10 o'clock at night to 2 in the morning and then from 2 to 6 to guard the tent, walk the perimeter. Otherwise it will be petrol bombed. And myself and a couple of others volunteered. That was my first encounter with them. And then I got involved in other projects with them. And I wanted to get involved with them because these were men that, they, they lived what I, I was reading. They trusted God for their finances. They weren't salaried. They took on big projects. They, they hired the, the, the showground, the royal showground in the Stubbington Coventry. It cost, well, the price of a car in those days without any money. And they prayed in the money. And God provided year after year after year. And I thought, wow, I'd, li- I'd like a faith like that. And when you spent time with them, it, it catches. It catches. We all need role models. People, we can see God at work in. I think, I'd like a bit of that. So you can't inherit faith, but you can catch it. Spend time with those who have it. That's Joshua's prayer. The faith I've got, I want to pass on to you folks. The knowledge God is faithful. Secondly, verses 4 to 5, hope. Hope. Remember, verse 4 says, Remember how I have allotted an inheritance to your tribe, uh, all the lands of the nations that remain. The nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the west. The Lord your God himself will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. Because God keeps his promises, there is always hope. Always hope. And those who belong to God should never be in fear and doubt. You know, we had a funeral service here on Thursday, and it was great to say that the lady who was in the coffin just there and is now buried in the ground at Holly Hill died in hope. Her body's in the ground, but she is present with the Lord. She was a believer in Christ. That is the hope God gives us. The greatest enemy we ever face in life is death. And we are conquerors in Jesus Christ. It's not a black chasm we fear. Hey, we are entering into the light. We're going into something far better, the Bible says. Hope. Now Joshua says, I've divided up the land, but there are still some enemies remaining. You've got to go and conquer them. And God has promised, if you go and do your bit, he'll do his bit, and he'll drive them out before you. And the Christian life's a bit like that. God is there every morning, but you've got to get your feet out of bed and get on your knees or sit in your chair and have time with him. You've got to do your bit. You know, there's a world waiting to be reached out there. We've got the answer, but we've got to take it to them. It's not going to happen automatically. There's an emphasis on us to go and do our bit, and God promises he'll do his bit. He's promised to expel the enemies, to drive them out. But pick up your your shield, pick up your spear, pick up your sword, and go get them. It requires effort. Nothing ever happens without effort and commitment. 
And it certainly won't in this church happen without effort and commitment. If you want it on a plate, all served up to you, it's not going to happen. It might at the harvest meal, but it won't happen in life. Have a look at this Bible. Now, chances are you have never seen that Bible before. It belonged to this guy here. Anyone know who he is? He is Sir Ernest Henry Shackleton, C-V-O, O-B-E, F-R-G-S, F-R-S-G-S, whatever that lot means, an Antarctic explorer at the late 18th, early 19th century. Probably the most famous Arctic explorer. Incredible man. And uh, he did three great expeditions into the Antarctic. And on one time, his boat got crushed by the ice. And he had 27 men. His crew was made up of 27 men. And for two years, they survived in lifeboats, by living on the ice that was floating, by climbing over mountains. It was a long, hard slug. For two years, he survived. And the Bible is there because he said to his men, this ship's going down. We can only take our bare minimum with us. So he got his Bible and he tore out certain pages. He took the cover because that was signed by the Queen with Psalm 23 written on it. So he kept that and then he tore certain pages. He knew that he couldn't take the whole Bible but he wouldn't go without his Bible. So he took selected pages so that he could read them when he was going around. That was not an optional extra for him. It was an essential. An essential. Why? Because our hope ultimately is in what God has promised. And even when this life is taken, if he hadn't made it, or his 27 men, and they all survived, every one of them, but if they hadn't made it, that's not the end. They'd be with God in glory. That was his belief. And every Christian needs to seize their spiritual inheritance. Where do we find our spiritual inheritance? Well, the Word of God tells us tells us all we have in Christ. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. What are those blessings? Well, you've got the book. Find out. Read it. Why do I have to tell you every week? Do it yourself. <laughs> That's why you have to study the Word, don't we? Collectively we come, and I'll try and help you, but in the week you have to do your own study, your own plot. Discover what those blessings are and enjoy them. They will prepare you for life, and they will fill you with hope. And a Christian without hope, I would suggest, is maybe one who's not reading the Bible and not praying to God. Just a suggestion. Here's the third key word, obedience. Obedience. Look at verse 6 to 7. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without running aside to the right or the left. Don't get distracted. It's not rocket science. It's basic. Read the law of Moses, read your Torah, read your Bible, he's saying. Ah, this will take us to the left or the right. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the name of their gods or swear by them. You must serve them or you must not serve them or bow down to them. Hey, the, the condition, if you want to inherit the land... If you want your spiritual blessings, it requires obedience. Obedience. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Excuse me. Just decided to break the zapper, but I think it will still work. Let me show you a little video clip. And when I, I, I thought of dogs when I, it came to obedience. And most of them have it. This first one doesn't. This is the world's worst. Nelson. Nelson here. Nelson, come here. Here, here, here. Nelson, come here. by the jolly sheep you know in churches this morning there's some pretty poor Christians and the world chases them here's how it should be done come on okay 
way Walk on, good girl. Up, good kid, good kid, good girl. Yes. Shepherd and follow him. Things work out. Obedience, obedience. Joshua started his book way back in chapter one, verse seven. Be strong and very courageous. And what did he say? Be careful to obey all that is written in the law of Moses. And how does he finish his book? Exactly the same. Be strong and courageous. Remember to obey what God has said. We are such creatures of, uh, how can I say it? Uh, we're poor at retaining information, aren't we? Either we, we? Often selectively. And God has to say it again and again and again. To individuals, to groups of people. And he tops and tails his book with the same instructions. Here's the next key word. Dependence. Dependence. Verses 8 to 10. But you are to hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of the... So one of, your, one of you routes the thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. Now I deliberately did a kid's talk that tried to link into this passage. And we had a number of items. A peg, tape, blue tack. I wonder if you remember them all. Hair clip, stapler, rivet, Velcro. All things that fix, that hold, that bind together. And of course, as we remember, we're reminded, the purpose of a peg is to keep the washing off the ground so that it stays clean and dry. And without the peg, it falls onto the ground and it gets dirty. You fix it to the line with a peg. And Joshua's command for the Jewish people is not complicated. He says, fix yourselves to the Lord. Stick with him. Cling to him. Hold fast, the NIV says. Hold fast. It's literally cling to God the very first use of that word you'll be very familiar with if ever you go to a wedding you hear it mentioned and at some stage in a wedding ceremony when Mr. and Mrs. Lovey are at the front making their vows together you'll hear these words a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be fixed cling joined velcroed blue tacked sellotaped together that's where it's used and that's what joshua says we need to do you know in human relationships you grow more independent as you grow older so a little baby is 100 percent dependent on parents if they don't feed it and change its nappy it dies so 100 percent it depends but then as a little child they get a little bit braver you go to a park and they run off to the swings but they're always looking for you, and sooner or later they run back. So there's a little bit of independence, but they always want mom or dad there. And then as teenagers, there's a bit more independence. I ain't holding your hand in public, no way. But they need you for food, for clothing. They need you to take them to school and the disco, wherever they're going. So they're dependent on you, but there's a bit more independence there. And then as young adults, they go off to university, and it's freedom. But keep the checks coming. <laughs> keep the money coming. You know, and I've got, uh, Dad, I need a car. Can you lend me some money? I've got this problem. So the independence in human life, of course, then they find Mr. and Mrs. Wonderful. They find a partner. And then it's, they start their own family. So in a human relationship, total dependence gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. Of course, it may all go pear-shaped and it'll come back again, but that's life. In a spiritual relationship, it's the opposite. When we first become Christians, we don't really know God, so we kind of trust him, but he's at a distance. And the key is to develop a closer and closer and closer walk and more and more dependence. 
And we only do that as we get to know his character, that he is trustworthy, trustworthy. And Joshua says, you stick to God, because that's key. Here's the next word. Oh, I've missed one out. Look at that. You get a freebie. Should have been love in verse 11, but you can look at that yourself. Let's go straight on to sanctification, verses 12 to 13. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain, if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure the Lord your God will no longer drive out the nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your back and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Sanctification means to be set apart, to be set apart. Um, If you book a ticket to the theatre or to a football match or to an event, you go there and there may be a hundred people in the building or a hundred thousand people there, but you walk up to your seat for your seat number and if there's someone in it, you say, excuse me, pal, out. Or you'd be more polite. You say, excuse me, I think you're in the wrong seat. This is mine. That's set apart for your use only. That's what it means to be sanctified. Sanctification is set apart for God's use. And Joshua says, if you go with the other nations and you marry them, you'll end up practicing their practices and worshiping their gods. You want a case study? Think of Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. Solomon, who we're told, he had brains, but he had no, no resistance, no self-control. We're told he took 700 wives and 300 concubines, 1 Kings 11.3. And one of the saddest verses of the Bible is 1 Kings 11.4. And we read this about this great man who had wealth, who had power, who had brains, wisdom, but couldn't, trust, couldn't control his, uh, his, uh, his listing. We're told, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. at her wow and then sooner or later over time over time he took on their practices he took on their gods there's a reason the bible says you know watch who you associate with you know christian if you link up with a non-christian in a relationship it's not going to work out healthily you know on camp with the young people sometimes i used to put a chair and, and, and call one of the youngsters up and stand on a chair. And I'd say to them, uh, can you, no, I'd get them to stand on the chair and I'd stand at the bottom and say, can you lift me up? And of course they'd try and lift, and it was almost impossible. Even if they had the strength, they would hurt their back and they would probably topple off the chair. But I'd say, give me your hand. Straight down they came. Didn't hurt them. It's easier to pull down than to lift up. And God warns us in those relationships, even in business, Sometimes we can link up in business with someone who has one focus, money, and all their time, all their efforts are going into making money and they expect you to do the same. And those principles override your other principles. So be careful who you link up with in relationships and in business. People affect us. Solomon himself in the Proverbs said, you walk with the wise, you become wise. They affect you. David in Psalm 1 says, if you walk with the sinful, Don't be surprised if you stand with the sinful and don't be surprised if you're sitting with the sinful. It's deterioration. This book's never wrong. And then lastly, reverence, verse 14 to 16, reverence. I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. And then he goes on to give the sweet and sour the sweet and sour. Some things are good, some things are negative. If you obey God, it'll work out good. If you disobey God, it will work out sour. It will be bad. And that's true in any relationship. 
You know, if I want my marriage to work, then I make wise choices. If I make wrong choices, it causes friction and problems in the marriage. Children and parents make bad choices, tension, problems. Make good choices, happiness, contentment. All relationships reply, depend on good or bad choices. And that's how uh, Joshua finishes this little section. Have a reverence for God, fear him and obey him. Why, is God nasty then and he just punishes us? No, he cares for us. C.S. Lewis used to say, Christians don't want a heavenly father, they want a heavenly grandfather. And they, what they mean by that is grandparents can spoil the kids because they're going to send them home later with the parents. And the parents have to deal with all the problems that the grandparents caused. God is not a heavenly grandparent. He's a heavenly father. He will at times say no. He will at times say go to your room. He will at times take your phone away from you. Why? Because he loves you. He doesn't want you to become spoilt. And in Hebrews 12, 7 to 11, it says, the, sign, the fact that God disciplines us is a sign we belong to him, that he's our father and with his children. And if he doesn't discipline us, is it because we're not part of his family? So God gives the sweet and the sour. Make good choices so that I can bless you. But if you make bad choices, I will correct you because you're mine and I'm yours. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these words of Joshua. Help us to take them in and uh, help us to apply them to our own hearts and situations, we pray. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.